Hello, everyone, and welcome to our fourth session of the day. Tools, strategies, and techniques to empower communities for equitable and inclusive resilience planning. My name is Kayla Breland, and I'm with the NOAA Disaster Preparedness Program. It's an honor to be here, and I hope you have enjoyed today's sessions as much as I have. The Southeast and Caribbean is a diverse region of institutional, historical, and cultural dynamics. Within our region are groups of people living in frontline communities. Frontline communities are those that experience the first and the worst of the consequences of climate change. They're disproportionately impacted by disaster and have less advantages and limited access to resources. As communities work to dismantle the legacies of inequality and injustice and break the barriers to resilience, recovery, and adaptation, they often find themselves overwhelmed. We recognize that the conversation surrounding justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion is sensitive, and our goal today is to deliberately and intentionally transfer knowledge, have meaningful engagement, and empower communities to continue their pursuit and equitable resilience. We hope to share a repertoire of resources that our at-risk communities can utilize and share across their networks to make real progress. Our amazing lineup of speakers will share successful tools, strategies, and techniques in various categories, such as emergency planning and preparedness, data, direct access to funding, communications, outreach, and educational tools, and building community resilience. Our time with you today is limited, and we have not allocated any time for questions, but please feel free to submit your questions in the question box, along with your contact information. We will share your questions with the speakers. We'll begin today with our keynote speaker, Caroline Lewis of the Clio Institute. Also joining us is Ruth Santiago from the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council, Dr. Kim Waddell with EPSCOR Virgin Islands, Frank Neepold with the NOAA Climate Program Office, Keisha Long with the South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control, Rick Miller with the Atlantic Council, and Dominica Zhu with the Opportunity Project Access and Innovation Labs. Thank you, Caroline, for being with us today. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. It's not a good thing when I'm talking to myself, but thank you all so very much. It's a pleasure to be here among my people. Um, I kind of manifest the Southeast and Caribbean. I was born and raised in Port of Spain, Trinidad. Grew up eating mango and guava and tamarind off the trees in the parks in my beautiful uh, hometown. And I guess, I hope all of you, when you're talking about resilience and food insecurity, you remember this and maybe you grow a few more fruit trees wherever you can to help people. So I really feel honored to be the keynote speaker today because I have some stories to tell, but more than anything, I wanna thank each and every one of you for being in this fight, for being in this line of work. And we always say now more than ever, but I do mean it. You understand this, the severity of the climate crisis. You know it's a threat multiplier to all the things we worry about. And you understand that vulnerability has a way of manifesting itself very unevenly in society at large. So as we talk about the climate crisis and we get past sea level rise, because that is like the gateway drug to get everybody to pay attention. But it's more than that, as you all know, it's about food and water and heat and health and security. It's about the economy and the ability to prepare for or recover from some of these impacts of the climate crisis and how we do all of this while building a sense of urgency and a sense of agency in everybody, not just the frontline communities, but those who serve them, not just the elected officials, but the commerce that drives the industry in our cities and countries. Because it's gonna take all of us to move the needle. And we have to work really hard to make sure that the political and economic world understands the scientific concept of the climate crisis and how urgent this data is and embrace that science and to really understand the scope of injustice. And if we can get the scientists to understand some of those justice issues and the justice communities to understand enough science to advocate in their own interest, we can have that collision, that momentum for change that is so desperately needed. And to get the political and economic engines to work around 
the urgency of the science and the justice stories that are emerging more rapidly than we can react. It's up to us, all of you listening, all of you working in this field, to remind them of that big picture, to go from the here and now in your backyard, in your hyper-local community, but pull back to the big picture. So as everybody on this call, as you see yourself as a hamster on a wheel, effecting change, let's picture all these hamster wheels, at least spinning in the same direction, so that as we collide the science and justice worlds, the political and economic leaders can get the momentum they need to help us all achieve what we're after, which is minimizing vulnerability and maximizing resilience. So when we talk about building resilience, I know you talk about that a lot and you get it, but for whom or for what? Are we, being, are we talking about infrastructure resilience? Are we talking about human infrastructure? Are, are we understanding it's both? Because as we improve the physical infrastructure, we make lives better for humanity and biodiversity. But understanding the true scope of vulnerability in the populations we serve or want to serve becomes a difficult job for us. So I'll tell you a quick story. I'm in Miami-Dade County. So I was born in Trinidad, but I, I moved to Miami in my 20s and I married the first man I ever met who was born in Miami. It's quite uh, something. Everybody from is from somewhere else. But I look at the county I live in, which is almost 3 million people. And based on federal level of poverty, about 17 to 20% of the 3 million people living in Miami-Dade County, just under that, are poor. But if you look at the ALICE reports, which quantifies the working poor, ALICE is an acronym for Asset Limited, Income Constrained, but Employed. So you're ALICE if you're the working poor, living paycheck to paycheck, and really could not handle a $500 catastrophe in any given month. It could lead you to becoming homeless. So when we talk about poverty levels, I urge you, if you don't have access to ALICE reports done by the United Way, then maybe ask for them to be done in your area. But work towards understanding, like I have come to understand, it's more like 57% of Miami-Dade County that is poor or working poor. That's a big difference. I remember after Hurricane Irma, when all the nonprofits were getting together to go to the budget hearing with the county commissioners to make a case for more urgent help right now, it was kind of um, contentious. So I signed up for my two minutes to speak as well. And I had found all of the nonprofits really reeling against the commissioners and a lot of the commissioners reeling against the nonprofit. Like, who are you? And, and I didn't see you handing out bread and sandwiches and water like I was. So when I got my two minutes to speak, I said, look, folks, you are out there, you commissioners out there helping your community. And we nonprofits were out there serving our community. But if together, all of us reached 200,000 people, I would be surprised. But let's say we did. Do you understand that with about 3 million people, about 1.5 million of us are so vulnerable economically that we cannot prepare for or recover from some of these disasters. So the scope of vulnerability is nothing I feel we're wrapping our arms around enough. And I want to encourage you to measure that vulnerability in a more holistic way. Because we always tell people we want to build communities that can take care of themselves, that are resilient pull themselves up by the bootstraps. But if you don't have boots, you really are in a situation that is as helpless as you ever want to be or don't want to be. So I would say to all of us is to celebrate the momentum we are building towards a more just future for everybody, to help the most vulnerable see where they're heading and what they can do about it, and to help build some of that agency in not just the frontline communities, but the government and economic engines that serve them and the nonprofits that work with them as well. 
So I am the founder of the nonprofit, the Clio Institute. And Clio is an acronym for Climate Leadership, CL, through engagement opportunities. Because I believe that education is really not the filling of a pail, it's the lighting of a fire. And I get that quote from William Butler Yates, who said it, that education is not the filling of a pail, it's the lighting of a fire. And I really and truly see all of us as educators who are arsonists, who are trying to light fires in each other and with the government and commerce industries that serve the work we're trying to do and the other nonprofits that work with us. So if you're an arsonist and you're in this fight, you are welcoming opportunities to let everyone rise up, but to paint an honest picture of the scope of vulnerability that exists and to be realistic. So back in 2014, when my nonprofit that was serving everybody, top down, bottom up, making them more climate literate, more climate aware. When I stopped and did some gap analysis in about 2014, I realized that the frontline communities were not engaging we're not able to come to our sessions and panel discussions and classes and courses and film screenings. So I ap ap appealed to one of our funders for money to do some work in these underserved communities. And I went in there and I made a pitch and I was brilliant, I thought. And then I was told, no, I was told that's not what we fund. Well, I had a, a mini temper tantrum, I must tell you. And I threw this hissy fit in the man's office, a young man, lovely man. We, we really liked each other and he understood. I said, you are a fraud. Because if you look at your website, your website says that this is exactly what you wanna do, to build civic engagement around areas of justice. And so, make a long story short, I got the funding to do these pilots. And what we did is we were practicing, before I even understood it, we were practicing procedural justice. You probably have heard that term. It's been spoken about quite a bit recently, but procedural justice means that those of, us, those of us working to lift the voices of frontline communities have to embrace the statement, nothing for us without us. So when I got this funding to go into these communities, I picked two low-lying communities that were subject to sea level rise and king tides and flooding and two high ground communities that were built on the ridge in Miami-Dade County that didn't have that flooding problem, but were claiming to have climate gentrification. So in these four communities, over the course of a year, we did listening sessions, understanding what these frontline community members knew or wanted to know and wanted to understand. And from those listening sessions, we built an agenda for a, a town hall. And I identified somebody from those communities to run the town hall with me. I was like a guide on the side, but they ran. It. And we brought city and county staff and a couple of elected officials and the frontline communities to this most beautiful meeting of the minds of those serving the frontline communities and the frontline communities. And you know what happened? A new understanding of resources that were available that the frontline communities didn't know were available. And things that they needed that emergency planning operations didn't know they needed. And when they were creating water stations and cooling centers in regions where frontline communities couldn't access, then we have a solution that's not really a solution. So arranging for these meetings of the mind, these town halls becomes really authentic to get a seat at the table for the frontline communities to involve, to be involved and have that seat at the table to inform the action. Nothing for us without us. So, and then we did some trainings where we did some climate one-on-ones and helped them become climate speakers in their own community. So it was really uplifting. We walked so many sleeping giants in these frontline communities that are now able to advocate for themselves and in their own interests. It's very heartening to see this momentum building in the right way. But all of them told us, we want much more education. We did not know why we didn't know this. We showed them a map of Miami-Dade County and inundation levels at two feet, four feet, six feet, and eight feet of sea level rise. And those living on the high ground had their 
faces to the flag going, oh, that's why they want our property. They didn't understand elevation was a development issue. So long story short, as we are mapping all of these vulnerability things, including elevation and poverty levels and um, access to septic tanks versus sewers and all the things that the good people like you are looking at and trying to quantify so that we're prioritizing the right things, let's make sure we have a seat at the table for the most vulnerable communities to tell us what they want us to work on as well. Because more often than not, they're shining a light on an issue that we did not think about. One young woman in Little Haiti was telling me, I know what you're saying about the nighttime temperatures, Miss, because I used to open up my window at night to let in a little cool air. And now when I do that, there's no cool air coming in the night. And I said, you don't have air conditioning? And she said, no. And I said, well, why are your windows closed? And she says, well, it's not safe. So... Since 2015, I have been banging on the doors of Miami-Dade County to give us a roadmap to air conditioning, all government subsidized housing. Do you know it's required for them to have heat in the housing, but not AC? So looking at some of the low hanging fruit to get to a just future, we have to require policy changes that require air conditioning. I want us to also start mapping solutions. So I'm gonna leave you with a couple of thoughts because I know this time goes quickly. I would love you when you're mapping the vulnerability pieces so that we can overlay the vulnerability maps and see who we need to help. Be honest about it. Be honest about it in the way you're talking about the need to put retreat on the table, relocation. When we have people living in repetitive flooding areas. We cannot reassure them that we're gonna build back exactly as it was. We have to make sure that we're showing them we're planning. So when you map solutions, when you map areas where relocation has successfully happened, when you map where you have converted septic tanks that are failing to sewer connections, when you start mapping air conditioning in homes, people start seeing hope and they start seeing momentum in a direction that's more tangible to them. After a storm, some people's medicines go bad because they cannot refrigerate them. How do we address that? And if we find a solution, how do we map it? So all in all, I'm going to ask each of you to see yourself as an agent of change and not just to look for vulnerability, vulnerability but to map the solution to minimize that vulnerability and work towards solution orientedness. And guess what? When we start mapping solutions, I bet the political folks will want to get to claim a piece of that. The companies are going to want to sponsor accelerating some of that. So maybe we can create some excitement around solving, not just mapping the problem. And I, I want you to see yourself as an arsonist, as an educator, as somebody who is lighting a fire in everyone you touch every day with the solution orientedness that is needed in our work. Without it, we can suffer climate grief to an extent that's hard to shake off. But do it and take a big bite out of the problem because you are so needed and so important and our collective ripple effect is nothing I could ever measure but I can assure you is tremendous. And if anybody ever tells you to be careful not to bite off more than you can chew, you tell them this, I would rather choke on greatness than nibble on mediocrity. I read that somewhere and I have been choking on greatness or trying to ever since then. So welcome aboard, thank you for being in the fight and for sharing your incredible tools that the audience is about to lap up, I am sure. And I appreciate giving this speech to you and hoping you understand your value. Awesome. Thank you so much, Caroline. I know I would not want to be on the receiving side of your passion and your hissy fit, so as you said, um, but I am definitely charged and motivated. Um, 
And I think you have an amazing point in building those authentic relationships and bringing in, you know, not only the frontline community, but those who serve the frontline communities and having that organic conversation. Um, I think that sets a great stage uh, for our presentation today. So next up, we have Ruth Santiago with the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council, and I will turn it over to you, Lou. Thank you. Thank you, Kayla, uh, and hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm happy to be participating in the Southeastern Southeastern Caribbean Disaster Resilient Partnership Annual Meeting. Um, so uh, resilience is a term that we hear quite often, and um, so I want to go a little bit beyond that and, and encompass also um, the environmental and climate justice and even um, energy and democracy discussion we're having in Puerto Rico. Next slide, please. Um, so I guess most people here know that Puerto Rico is steeped in multiple crises, um, economic, fiscal, climate crisis, earthquakes, COVID-19, and probably some that I haven't mentioned. And um, a lot of that comes from uh, the development model that was selected in Puerto Rico, heavily based and centered on tax exemptions and other incentives for, for private investment, which um, have has resulted in unfortunately high unemployment rates um it's usually three times of the national average of the u.s compared to the u.s and there are certain environmental justice communities that are uh, even more than that um it's a very high poverty rate as you all know about 43 percent to sometimes even higher median household income is is uh, about a third or, or a little over um uh sorry uh yeah, it's about, about a third of the U.S. Uh, median, and um, we have, ironically, um, the second or third highest electric rate of any U.S. jurisdiction. Um, also, that is coupled with a public debt that, it, combined with other obligations, is about $112 billion. That's been in the news recently. And as a result, we've seen throughout Puerto Rico's history, but especially after Hurricane Maria, um and and when the recession started in about 2006 uh the, the migration the out migration of about 700,000 people uh from puerto rico and many of them working age people and professionals etc um and so uh, this is um this, this is a situation that's difficult for anybody but especially for as um was mentioned earlier, frontline communities, environmental justice communities that are disproportionately impacted and burdened by, especially, uh, I'm going to focus here on um, the electric system and uh, centralized fossil fire generation. And so in these regions that I'll discuss, uh, the, the poverty rates, the unemployment rates, the school dropout rates are higher, and yet the services are less and less. Um, and that's um, primarily the case in the Guayana region in southeastern Puerto Rico. Next slide, please. And so this is just a visual uh, presentation of the two most contaminating power plants in Puerto Rico, the AES coal-fired plant in Guayama and the Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority Aguirre Power Complex in Salinas, which is part of the, the same region. Next slide, please. So it, it's a classic environmental injustice situation, but but certainly the uh, hurricanes, the 2017 hurricanes, uh, Maria and Irma before it, um, impacted everyone on the island, right? And so um, it, the actual design of the electric system um, was an, uh, a factor that contributed to most people being without power for months and months, um, some people for close to a year, I guess you all know. Um, so it, 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 this is really not just attributable to the natural uh, disaster that's, that, that we're seeing, you know, more frequent and intense hurricanes, but also the, the uh, design and the structure of the electric system. And so people became, one of the big lessons learned um, uh, in Puerto Rico is that communities and people be, need to become energy literate and implement 
different measures and tools and strategies like energy efficiency and otherwise participate, be active participants in the electric system. We have, as you know, a public a utility called PREPA, which needs a radical transformation, both in terms of the technology and the governance and um, community empowerment and participation in the electric system as what is were to call as prosumers, energy producers, not just passive consumers. And how can that be achieved? Well, we have a golden opportunity right now, which I sometimes call the Puerto Rico Energy Green New Deal, which involves using the huge amount, historic amount of FEMA and HUD um, disaster recovery funds, which have not yet been dispersed for the electric system, to to power to finance that radical transformation of the electric system that we need. Um, but we need the federal government to earmark those funds for distributed generation, renewable generation, especially rooftop solar and storage that so many studies and, um, and common experience shows is, is the most resilient option for Puerto Rico. And so the, our public utility needs to work with organized communities. That's fine, you can go to the next. Organized communities, local contractors, and achieve um, a measure of energy democracy um, using these FEMA and HUD funds. Um, we've actually come together some different uh, civil society groups to create a, civil uh, a proposal for that kind of transformation of the electric system in Puerto Rico. It's called We Want Sun, Queremos Sol. We encourage you to look it up. The, the website is, is uh, on that slide um, and uh, feel free to uh, endorse and ask questions. And um, it's basically um, a proposal that, as I mentioned, um, different sectors of society came together to produce and it is centered on the technical transformation, basically from the central station, fossil fired generation, mostly in Southern Puerto Rico, impact in um, environmental justice communities uh, with transmission systems that run uh, from south to north are in the path of the hurricanes and very vulnerable to all kinds of hazards. Um, transform, make, do that trans, the technical transformation towards on-site or rooftop uh, solar, battery energy storage systems, um, demand response programs, energy efficiency, et cetera, all of the alternatives to that centralized uh, transmission distribution, et cetera. Next slide, please. And also, Queremos Sol includes um, a transformation of the, government stru the governance structure of the public utility so that, for example, right starting from the board down, it has representation from uh, civil society groups that include community, labor, uh, professional groups, et cetera. Um, and so Puerto Rico is at a um, juncture where we really need to decide um, what we do with this historic amount of FEMA, HUD, and federal government funding for disaster recovery. And um, do we rebuild the current system of, of what you see on the slide, those centralized fossil fired power plants or and with the transmission systems, which are also centralized and vulnerable to hurricanes, earthquakes, uh, flooding, all kinds of hazards, or do we create a more uh, empowering, community empowering alternative um, like uh, mostly rooftop solar storage at on existing structures that are so prevalent in Puerto Rico, uh, the so-called urbanizations, residential housing, levitated homes that are sprawling, sprawling malls, the institutional buildings, the industries of commerce, etc. Plenty of rooftop space. In fact, we call it in Puerto Rico rooftop resource. Um, and, and, and cite those um, those PV panels and, and, and battery energy storage systems and uh, right where it's needed, right where the demand is and um, just cut out that transmission cost and vulnerability. Um, and so some community groups that we're working with have already started to do pilot pro projects, but of course we know that this can only scale with um, those, those federal funds that, that are a historic amount. Um, and so, 
uh, pilot projects are fine. We're doing those. Those are tools, and then people can see what they are. But um, right now, mostly only people who are well off can afford to uh, acquire or lease these uh, rooftop solar systems, and we need to incorporate um, equity uh, and racial and, and, and social and uh, environmental justice into the equation using those federal funds. So um, thank you for the time, and unfortunately, I have to jump to another meeting. Um, so enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Ruth. We appreciate you. And I think, you know, you really connected the dots with what Caroline was saying about reusing the civil groups and connecting them back um, to the frontline communities and making that connection between what's really needed in the community and where the federal government can help. Um, next, we will have Dr. Kim Waddell with EPSCOR Virgin Islands share some of his uh, tools and insights with us. Uh, thank you, Kyla. Uh, and good afternoon, I'm Kim Waddell, and would like to first thank uh, the SCDRP team for the opportunity to present to you today. Um, so in addition to being the director of VI EPSCOR, which is a NSF's supported research and capacity building program here at the University of the Virgin Islands, I'm also the project lead for the next hazard mitigation update for the U.S. Virgin Islands the territory. And uh, we're doing this in conjunction with colleagues here at the university, as well as with our, our partners at VITIMA, which is the Virgin Islands Territorial Emergency Management Agency. So it's with that focus and that hat that I'm wearing that I, I want to uh, share some thoughts on, on building resilience. And so, um, as most of you know, and you've heard throughout the day, the Caribbean is threatened by a suite of natural hazards, uh, several which are exacerbated by climate change, especially our tropical storm you know, intensity in particular, like we saw in the 2017 hurricanes of Irma and Maria. Uh, but here in the VI, we're also dealing with, uh, for example, right now, a, a, a very severe drought um, uh, throughout the Virgin Islands, and it's also impacting parts of Puerto Rico. And then we have more nuanced uh, threats like sea level rise and um, uh, you know, warmer temperatures, especially in our urban areas. And again, you've heard from people like Pablo and others who spoke earlier today. Um, and so these threaten our populations, in particular our vulnerable populations. Um, and so it's something that we have to deal with as we think about hazard mitigation. Next slide, please. So this is a, a busy graphic, but the main thing I want you to sort of take away and understand about this is that hazard mitigation traditionally, whether it's FEMA sponsored or, or uh, primarily FEMA sponsored, is that they often look at the left side, which is the critical infrastructure and all of the built environment, the, the government facilities, you know, our energy or transportation, just as we heard with roofs around energy production in the previous uh, uh, presentation. But we're also looking at essential services. And I think that's a more holistic approach, especially if you want to think about equity, uh, uh, you know, in dealing with environmental justice. And unfortunately, those are actually more challenging issues. And so everything on the right uh, that's highlighted in yellow, these essential services with the critical infrastructure basically build towards a more resilient, in our case, Virgin Islands. But you have to think about the economy, housing, education, healthcare, because all of those add to the quality of life and well-being of all citizens, and in particular, the underserved and underrepresented. Next slide, please. So this is another way of, of, of sort of framing or saying the same thing. You know, take the disaster event like we had in 2017 with Irma and Maria. You see this large uh, uh, response and recovery effort often funded by the federal agencies that brings in a lot of federal dollars. And then those dollars through local government and other agencies are targeting, you know, a variety of, of sectors. Obviously, infrastructure is a primary focus uh, historically, and some goes to, you know, people and sectors. But we really need to look at, from a resilience standpoint, we need to look at things like governance, 
ecosystems and this livelihoods and well-being. And so those targeted investments really have to embrace all of this. And it's, it's not easy. Uh, next slide, please. So, you know, when we look here in the Virgin Islands, what we've been doing is, you know, first we identify what are these underlying disaster uh, risk drivers, you know, and so, for example, these maps show the level of development with dark red being highly urbanized and then the green being uh, natural or, um, yeah, natural ecosystems or forests, except grasslands. But what you see here is that we have unplanned and rapid urbanization. And that actually increases the number of places that are exposed to risk. Uh, we also, like Puerto Rico, and like uh, Caroline mentioned in her opening remarks, uh, the poverty level is around 35, 40% here in the Virgin Islands, but that, that, that real number is probably 70, 60, 70% of the population is going paycheck to paycheck. So we have this poverty and inequality. And then, as I mentioned, the, the climate change and the variability in that climate, like the drought situation we're dealing with right now. But we also have these compounding uh, factors. And so like Puerto Rico, we've lost an, actually almost 18, 19% of our population over the last 10 years, according to the census. And that means our uh, shrinking tax base. Uh, we also, from a governance standpoint, don't have adequate risk-informed policies uh, and, and a variety of other issues that are governance related. Uh, our remoteness, you know, we are, you know, 1,000, 1,100 miles from Miami. We're 40 miles east of, of Puerto Rico. And so our supply chain issues, whether it's emergency supplies or just the cost of supplies are extremely high because of how, where we are. And then we only have about 88,000 people in the territory. So our supply chain, I mean, our, uh, you know, our availability of technology and the people to manage that technology is at an all-time low for the same reasons that people emigrated from Puerto Rico. We lost people who could afford to leave, or we lost a lot of the professionals, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then we have an overtaxed ecosystem, you know, whether it's fisheries or what have you. And so those are all layers that confound or make resilience a lot more complicated to, to aim for. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to have a few slides quickly to just talk about how things are getting worse or are challenging. And so one of the more common events, more common than hurricanes, are riverine flooding, which is basically heavy rainfall events that then channel water down our slopes and into our low-lying areas, which is where our towns are. And so this has increased considerably over the last 40 years. And um, again, the, the, the lack of a plan uh, land use plan really exacerbates some of this. But we also have problems with maintenance and infrastructure uh, that increases the, the flooding issues. And almost all of our vulnerable populations are near or in towns at low level, low lying areas that are almost always vulnerable to floods. And so those are the very people that have the least amount of resources to recover, to you know, rebuild or even have insurance to cover their losses. And so that exacerbates that issue again. Uh, next slide. You know, the reality is that we're such a small island, a set of islands, and actually, you know, nearly half of our government buildings are in high risk areas. Um, you know, a quarter of our buildings are in flood or tsunami zones. And um, the insurance and the coverage, you can't even get you know, hurricane or flood insurance that's affordable for a vast majority of the families. And so we're really extremely vulnerable. Um, and so there is a high risk of catastrophic failure like Puerto Rico after Irma and Maria, you know, months and months, four, five, six months without power and things like that. Next slide. As I mentioned earlier, we have drought. This is just showing you graphically how uh, the frequency and duration of our droughts are getting uh, stronger or heavier uh, over the last uh, you know, few years, uh, decades. And um, this is a real issue for our farmers and for our uh, households that rely on rain and, and rain catchment and then their systems to store water because water runs about 12 to as much as 20 cents a gallon. And so to have a water delivery, you know, even say a 5,000 gallon water delivery, that's four or five hundred dollars. Uh, and that's, you know, that's higher than somebody's rent in some of these neighborhoods. And so it's prohibitively expensive. And so that water insecurity is not trivial. 
Same issue for our farmers who tend to be small, locally, you know, small producers, small acreage. Um, their ability to store water and manage these drought situations is challenging. Next slide. So I mentioned the maintenance, and this is just a nice graphic or as well as uh, photos to capture this. Some of our, you know, poorer or less well-maintained neighborhoods have, you know, culverts and drain dish, drainage ditches, dish, ditches that are, you know, cement lined, but plants and garbage and debris creep in if they're not being cleaned and checked regularly. And so once they fill, start filling in, like you see in the lower right picture, the fact is the efficiency uh, degrades and that area, once it gets hit with a lot of water, actually floods the banks and overflows because it can't drain fast enough. Next slide. So I've rushed through a bunch of slides and I, I want to have to take a few minutes to try to talk about the takeaways. As I think you've heard throughout the day, disasters hit these underserved uh, and underrepresented communities the hardest for all the reasons that I mentioned earlier. Recovery investments, and this is across the country, probably across the world, but certainly across the country and certainly here in the territory. The recovery investments, uh, you know, definitely favor the influential, the big businesses, the, the wealthy. Uh, they have the means, they have the capacity to file the paperwork, do all the things that it takes to get reimbursed or get, uh, you know, their, their funds solicited in, whereas, Poor communities don't have that infrastructure, don't have that capacity. And our, you know, our community-based organizations struggle to keep pace with that, uh, even as they try to help neighbors and communities. Hazard mitigation planning has to be holistic and really needs to think about these long-term issues around critical services, the health and education and all that. And those are long-term investments that really take uh, decades in some instances to fix. I mean, Puerto Rico's power or the Virgin Islands Power Authority is not meeting the needs of the community. So what do we do? How do we allocate those uh, recovery funds in a way that, you know, increases reliability of those services as well as keeps those costs down? And that's, that's a real challenge here in the, in the Virgin Islands. And so we have to think about maintenance. We have to think about those services in addition to the built environment and the infrastructure that, uh, that uh, supports modern society. And I think, you know, that re equitable recovery really does require this, the investment and the maintenance. And that comes back to governance. And that's something that is a talk for another day. But I think, I think, especially here in the Caribbean, governance is a challenge because of capacity, especially around the technical expertise that you need to maintain modern infrastructure and so forth, but also in education and health and other areas as well. So it's a, it's a negative feedback loop that really challenges us. And so I think I want to, you know, we are doing things like NOAA has a, the, the RESA program, this Regional Integrated Science Assessment. That's a powerful new tool that brings scientists, both social and, and natural scientists and environmental scientists with the communities working together to come up with solutions. That's one of the, I think, one of the clearest ways that we've heard about and that we're working on to try and address this longer term strategy to build resilience in the territory. So I think that my last slide just has, um, yes, uh, if you want to learn more about our, our hazard mitigation and resilience plan, the resilientvi.org will take you there. And then if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me directly at uh, the address posted there. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Waddell. And I really appreciate and, you know, I'm so interested in learning more about what it is you're doing and being on that forefront of that shift in mitigation to being more holistic and really supporting that community. And, you know, I love that the conversation is, you know, moving from how do we stop helping, you know, just the healthy and the wealthy and move to those, you know, right. more vulnerable communities, because a lot of times those are the people that we rely on. You know, you mentioned the farmers. Those are feeding the community and feeding it back up. So how can we work from the bottom up? Um, so it's wonderful to see that you guys are already on the forefront of that. And thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you. And up next, we have Frank Kniepold from the NOAA Climate Program Office, and he's going to share some outreach and communication and educational tools with us. Well, thank you so very much. The setup uh, could not be better for what I'm I'm going to add. Um, and you know, I feel I feel like we're just continuing to add. And I got to honor 
uh, Caroline, a good friend of mine and a mentor, early mentor, inspired a lot of what I do. And her words are ringing very loudly in my head right now. So, uh, but but the work that was built from Caroline's set up to to uh, the current talk uh, that I'm going to be working on, I think uh, hopefully you're hearing something that's really important as an educator, which I am, um, but but I'm much more than that now is coherence and relevance. So um, I, I framed this talk, and thank you for moving the slide, um, is about you know, something that is not what we usually talk about in this work, about building hope and community empowerment. Um, we talk about the science, we talk about the observations, we talk about the model, we talked about this, we talk about, but what we don't talk about is actually the building the social capacity. Um, and people are complicated. As a, as a social scientist and an educator, this is a really incredibly important part of the equation if you're talking about building resilience in communities to these very significant changes um, to our climate system and to our, our the implications to our uh, all the sectors of society. You got to have a focus about how you build the hope, that energy that people have, that they can actually make a change that is going to have agency, as Caroline said. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm very much in the a light of fire uh, camp of educators. So um, also on the bottom, I'm gonna represent uh, different resources uh, that, because this was about tools, strategies, and techniques. So for building community empowerment. So let's let's go to the next slide. One, one thing that I think um, that I wanna frame this for, and this could be said by many, many leaders, um, but I caught this quote by uh, Governor uh, Charlie Baker at a, a hearing. And I really want you to zoom in on, um, on that bolded part, uh, because what he's really saying here and, uh, is that um, if you want to do something, if you want to change a community, and I think the last speaker, Dr. Waddell, called for a change, a very clear uh, change. But if you want to do that, you're going to have to build support for that change locally. Um, if you don't, uh, have local support for it. It's not going to succeed. Whatever you're pursuing, it just won't be sustained over time. That is such a critical uh, framing reality that I think when we talk about these types of, of initiatives, we don't approach it from this vantage point. Um, and so if we don't do that, then uh, it won't be sustained, which means we'll have more vulnerability because climate hazards are going up and they're continuing to go up even depending on which climate uh, carbon pathway we choose, uh, we still have more vulnerability, more exposure, more risk, um, and thereby you're gonna have to have more change, which means you have to have more local engagement and support. So let's go to the next slide. I think that point is made, but one thing that, that um, when I'm looking at this work is you know, when you look at climate action, so the best analysis I have is the 2019 America's Pledge Report um, and what, it, what the careful analysis found was where are communities or businesses or faith organizations, universities, health organizations, states um, advancing climate actions. And you may think in wherever you are as a representative um, of a community um, where you live in the Southeast, um, you'll notice that there's a, a density difference across the country. You see some places where there's much more activity in one form of, of action or another, but, but what you don't have is, is a connection often between the people in those communities and the actions, the plans, the initiatives, and the vulnerability that's already been identified. And so if we don't have that connection, how do you build the local support? So um, let me just, just take that a little bit further. So next slide, please. Um, the, the, you know, I'm part of the national climate assessment process for the 2004, uh, I'm sorry, 2018 version and, um, NOAA is leading again, the 2000, uh, you know, to NCA five, which will come out in about 2023. Um, there's a lot of resources here. So if you have one of the tools, um, that is littered with strategies and techniques is the national climate assessment. So if that's already part of your radar, awesome. Lots of sub materials in there. There's even Spanish translations. If you're not aware, aware of that, then please incorporate that in there. And there's a lot of supporting piece. But there's a new thing that just came out. So next slide, please. That um, I'm really excited about is these state summaries, which are derivatives of that, 
because those regions are kind of gross. And I don't mean that in an icky way. I mean that in a, and it's just sometimes you, you're like, well, that's fine for Massachusetts, but really I want to know is what's going on in Vermont. And there's not enough information. These state levels have just been updated. So now they all have information in them at a much higher resolution for state level information. So I hope you find that information useful if you're trying to use this kind of information as inputs into your work on building resilience. Um, so that's one that's really important. But let's go to the next slide. I'm gonna get back to this, this local issue. Um, so uh, if we go to the next slide, please. There you go, perfect. Um, so one of the things when we look at this, because I come at this from an educator, community engagement, um, you know, workforce development perspective, because that's the charge I have at NOAA in the Climate Program Office, is that there's some challenges that are showing up in communities um, that where climate and action and community is actually getting hard. Um, a lot of times, this is a low priority issue for communities. Um, they, the people who are leading climate action are having a really hard time making and sustaining the case for climate action against all the other priorities. And one of the, you know, there's a lot of capacities for building that case. What we don't have is, um, is that alignment between our educational systems, our museums and universities and aquaria and media are not aligned on helping us make that case. Um, that's a, a, an easy place for us, and this is what's emerging, is to really focus there. So let me go to the next piece, and I wanna, I wanna big up, build on something um, Caroline said. What we don't do is we, de we build a lot of problem. This is a really big problem. It's a really big problem. Look at this details of how big this problem is. And, and what we're starting to understand is that hope is a precondition to action. But hope is something you can build. It's also something you can lose. Um, if you don't have agency, if you don't have a sense that we can make it better, and we actually have data coming out of the work that uh, George Space and Yale University are doing, is that they're seeing that this is this, there's a gap that's starting to show up in 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 hope. Um, and I think Caroline really called out, you know, I can't remember the exact line, um, you know, about so solution orientedness. We got to have that. If we don't, and as we build that local support and we build the capacity, if we don't have the solution orientedness, sorry, Caroline, um, then we're going to really have a problem because it's going to build a backlash. And that's sort of what's happening now. So let's go to the next slide. This is one of my favorite images because, you know, when you think of the southeast, you don't think offshore wind very much yet. Um, that's coming down to, say, North Carolina is what they're looking at right now. I looked at the maps just this morning and, and it still seems like it's very fuzzy. Although New uh, Louisiana and Texas look very promising, um, but that's not in the current cards. But, but think about this. You know, one of the greatest questions a student ever asked me was, so I, I, I was talking about climate change with them, the seventh grader, and he said, look, I, what I wanna know is, are all the jobs gonna change? And we're talking about equal opportunity. And this is a really just one part of the solution matrix that we are not getting people excited and, and ready to do exactly what this woman is doing. That is a daunting task, and yet it is an exciting call to action, but there's a lot of preparation to be able to carry that harness and be skilled in doing that work um, and doing it safely and calling people from all backgrounds into this opportunity. This is a really important part of our solution orientedness. Sorry again, but I'm gonna stop trying that one. But let's go to the next slide. I want you to think about connecting those climate action plans with those climate opportunities. These are where the, the uh, um, I think it's BOEM is the one that does this mapping with Department of Energy and NOAA, is where all the current plans are. The first one of these really big wind farms is just starting. Um, but the, the closest community college that has a program only has 10 students in it. That means we're misaligned between opportunity and, and preparation. That's a real thing that we have to close down so we draw people into the solution. So let's go to the next slide. So some other resources I just wanna make sure you're tracking is climate.gov is a, an amazing rich reservoir that I'm part of the leadership of. And that's a really important asset, but I want to zoom into another piece of that, which is the Climate Resilience Toolkit. And that's a really important asset for this work. So let's go to the next slide. I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. 
So in the Southeast, for example, we have a regional breakdown of information. A lot of the key information from the National Climate Assessment is here. It's plain language information. Lots of innovations are coming to this space, but you have a, a regionally specific information. If you go to the next step, slides, please. One of the key aspects of that is it's all built on the steps to resilience. And these steps about going from hazard knowledge, you know, what are the hazards, to actions, which was done repeatedly in the previous slot talks, we have got to show, let's just keep on animating through that, it's got to, through a couple of animations, is these, these, these other pieces of, of what do we need to know and then how can we do that? So we actually build agency, build action with people at community scale, um, and that's how you know that anxiety is avoided. You know that's fine. You can keep on going. So another piece of this is um, is case studies, and in the southeast, these are some of the case studies. You may be working on something that is not in one of these case studies. Tell us. Let us continue to build out this this understanding of where is resilience being built. What step are you in, and how does that? Because we're all in this together. We have to share with each other, and just just you know get back to the education piece. Next slide, please. Um, even though we're talking about the Southeast, and I do a lot of work in education, workforce development, community engagement, I want you to know that, that sometimes when we think, you know, these regional uh, efforts, that we only think about the partners who are in those regions. There are so many other organizations outside of the Southeast that are doing amazing, important uh, transformational work that you want to learn from. They may be in, in, the, in, in the Hawaiian Islands, they may be in Alaska, or they may be in the Northeast, or they may be in the Great Plains, Midwest, you name it. Um, there's a, but there's a, just a growth of amazing efforts here. Let's learn from each other. Let's talk to each other. Let's communicate with each other. And one of the ways we do that, thank you, is, um, is being networked. So this is a clean portal, but inside there is, is a lot of efforts to network all of these activities together so that we're not have the fastest way to do it is to leverage somebody's other work to collaborate. And this is how Carolina and, and I know each other, because we collaborate, we share, we learn from each other and we connect other people that um, we know with each other. Because it's 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 what we do together that's going to make um, this idea of resilient, um, low vulnerability and equitable and just transitions happen as fast as we need them to happen. Um, so. I just want to, you know, give you a sense of, of some of the opportunities before you. There's so much of what I didn't say today, but I couldn't agree more with what is hopefully and hopefully I've built up to the moment and then it will keep going in the panel. And if you need to get in touch with me, I have a very unique name. There's only two of us in the United States. One of them is at NOAA. The other one's retired. So that leaves it to me. You can find me. No way, please. Awesome. Thank you so much, Frank. Um, I, you know, I think you just really highlighted the importance of making that connection and bringing it to the locality and, you know, connecting with our education system and the kids. I think they are our most impressionable and our most influential and oftentimes the most loudest. I know in my career, I've used kids a lot to start that conversation with their families. Um, so I'm super excited and thank you so much for sharing all of those tools and resources with us. And coming up next, we have Keisha Long with the South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control, and she is going to talk with us about EJ Strong. Sounds like we're missing some audio from you. Thank you. There thank she is. you. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here today. I'm Keisha Long with a South Carolina Department of Health Environmental Control. I'm the Environmental Justice Coordinator here for the agency. And as part of my duties here, I regularly engage with environmental justice leaders in our state. We have regular meetings. And one topic that came up over and over again was emergency response. What do you do 
when something happens, who do you contact? Is there planning happening somewhere? And yes, there is planning, but it tends to be concentrated with emergency managers, professionals. That's their career. That's their job. But um, next slide, please. We heard the community and uh, we applied for a what's called a state environmental justice cooperative agreement with the environment protection agency and fortunately we were awarded a two hundred thousand dollar grant and our project is based on community managed disaster risk reduction putting communities and in particular environmental justice communities at the center of hazard planning hazard response and hazard recovery and our intent is to have this process it's really a process translated and to the entire region as well as the entire country uh, next next please Since this is a EPA grant, uh, we had to connect our emergency response program to particular environmental statutes. And so we're focusing on the Clean Water Act as well as the Clean Air Act. And so our trainings will focus on such hazards as hurricanes, flooding, chemical releases, and now in this new age on pandemics. The intent is to um, explore the causes and effects of different hazards, as well as the prevention and reduction of the, the consequences of the hazards and elimination of water and air pollution following the disasters. The trainings right now, we're using the hybrid approach. We intentional, uh, initially we're going to do four in-person workshops but because of COVID-19 that required us to be more flexible now we have actually a more robust system I think with hybrid participation so virtual as well as in in class participation and we have plans to do four workshops so this uh, go to the next slide please a little bit more about community managed disaster risk reduction. This particular program is based on something that was developed in the Philippines. And we are fortunate to have an instructor, a primary instructor that actually was in the Philippines and working with the communities there on this program. And now he, he's in South Carolina and he's also a professor at the University of South Carolina. A strategy of EJ Strong places EJ communities at the center of participatory disaster risk assessment and planning and implementation. It's to emphasize the importance of EJ communities being empowered to prepare and respond to hazards, as opposed to our what we have today. Traditionally, we have emergency managers who respond and you may see a gov the governor on the television and the heads of different agencies issuing directives and recommendations and then you're left to try to implement these recommendations whether you have the capacity to do so or not. Uh, our goal is to empower our participants to individually and at the community level to respond and recover from disasters efficiently and effectively. Therefore, just really a definition of resilience. Um, next slide, please. This is a picture of us at our first workshop and you can see at the top left corner, the virtual participants. And we were very fortunate to have uh, wonderful partner with us on this particular project. It's called LAMPSI. It is a nonprofit based in North Charleston, South Carolina. And they are a nonprofit that's composed of seven environmental justice communities. And they have 
um, actually helped us get this particular facility to hold our first workshop, which was in June of last year. Again, our intent is to have four training workshops. The fourth would be a train to trainer because you don't want things to stop here. Uh, the people who are participating are our community captains who will go forth and do the homework, the assessments, and to teach others how to respond to natural hazards. In between the, the major workshops, we're having virtual mini workshops. Uh, and all of them have been recorded. Again, the intent is to have all of this um, virtual so that it can spread throughout the country. All right, uh, next slide, please. To go through our partners, again, it's LAMPSI, that stands for Low Country Alliance for Model Communities. They're composed of seven neighborhoods in North Charleston, and there's also an adjacent neighborhood called Rosemont that is a community partner with us. Uh, DHEC is the project manager, uh, and USC and the College of Charleston are developing and delivering this customized training in CMDRR. USC also plans to issue a certificate to those who complete the training. So you will have a credential after the project is over. And USC will also be developing databases because we are collecting different data. We are using and developing different assessments, hazard assessments, uh, capacity assessments, vulnerability assessments, data that you can use to determine where to put your different resources when you respond to a hazard. Clemson University, who if you don't know, is actually a rival of USC. So we actually have them working together on this particular project. Uh, particularly for Clemson University, they're working on a food map. We found during this pandemic that food insecurity was an acute problem. Uh, people having trouble accessing food uh, here in South Carolina. It was not uncommon for the grocery stores to close, uh, for restaurants to be closed, and then there was a large group of people who were laid off. So it was very difficult for some to access food. Clemson University created a food map where you can access uh, food pantries, get hot meals, get meals delivered to your home. And they actually focus on the upstate of South Carolina where they're located. Uh, we partnered with them for this particular project so that they could expand the map throughout the state of South Carolina. Therefore, if you are in need of food or know someone who needs food, all you would have to do really is type in an address and you will get um, a list and a visual interpretation of where you could access food. Next slide, please. Now, um, we've as I said before, we've only completed one uh, in-person training right now, but the, we started, have to start with the basics, and this is uh, some paradigm shifts. Uh, right now, traditionally, we look at disaster risk in an equation, and that's hazard times vulnerability, traditionally. And in this first equation, capacity is subsumed by vulnerability. With the uh, community managed disaster risk reduction, this is a shift to a different equation where you have disaster risk equaling hazard times vulnerability divided by your capacity to respond. Natural, there, there are no natural disasters. That is something that we've emphasized in this program. There's no natural disaster, there are natural hazards. It becomes a disaster when you can't respond or inadequately to respond 
to a natural hazard. So since capacity is recognized as a separate variable and not subsumed by vulnerability, you can categorize your capacity, such as prevention, mitigation, survivability, readiness. It's uh, instilling the hope that um, Mr. Frank was referring to in his presentation. Uh, next slide, please. This is also another uh, paradigm shift. And I, I really like these pictures because the first one is showing our traditional thinking of vulnerability. You have um, the, the top left picture, a flood zone, and there's a home that is underwater and it's a poor home. And then right next door is the rich home that has miraculously survived the flooding even though it's next door. So with this particular thinking, the vulnerability is the condition of the element at risk. So your home as opposed to your location. And that has translated into um, grouping and categorization of vulnerabilities into different categories, physical, economic, social, environmental, cultural, uh, it's putting a label on your vulnerability because of what you are and not where you are. So the shift in the bottom right corner, you see the rich in a poor home in the flood zone and they're both flooded, which is, I mean, it seems logical, but for whatever reason, we, we hadn't really thought about things in that way. And then you see further up the hill, there's the medium vulnerability home and the low vulnerability home. So your vulnerability is based on your location, not on your condition. Okay, next slide, please. A few tools I wanted to highlight. We have gone through a lot of assessments and have fortunately have access to many different um, tools. I wanted to highlight a few though, uh, community members, people who live in the community, people who have stories, they know what used to be there and what, who's uh, sick and shut in and may need extra help or, or resources that you can't find on Google, you can't find on the South Carolina Emergency Management Division website, or it's not in a book. Community members are very valuable resource and uh, this EJ Strong, we're hypersensitive and hyper uh, focused on talking to community members and trying to tease out where are the vulnerabilities, what would you like to see? Um, we want to build back after a disaster, but not back to the current condition, which may not be the greatest, but build back to a higher condition to build back better. Also, EJ Screen uh, is a valuable resource. It has demographics, uh, locations of Superfund sites, uh, the uh, location of youth or those over the age of 64, um, economics, they, they added the sea level rise layer. So that has been a very helpful database from the EPA for us, as well as PLA tools. This participatory learning and action is a way to um, console and promote the active participation of communities in the issues and interventions, interventions that shape their lives. And there are many different types of PLA tools, such as mapping, uh, where you can, uh, it enables the community participants to identify on a map and analyze vulnerable areas, vulnerable groups based on location. Um, seasonal calendars uh, identify, identify periods of hazards, such as in summer, does it, uh, is it a heat island or 
what have you. And it's a problem tree analysis where it enables communities to identify hazards and its effects on the community as well as in the environment. So these are um, different tools you can use when you talk to community members to um, get information. And next slide, please. That is my contact information. Please feel free to reach out. And thank you so much for your time. Awesome, thank you so much, Keisha. I really appreciate you sharing the uh, EJ Strong program. And as a native and a first time resident in the South Carolina state uh, for the first time in 10 years, I'm super empowered um, by your mission and you know, using those federal funds in a creative way to really reach the community. Um, we hope that that was part of the takeaway for our participants today, you know, you can use, use unique opportunities and really make change um, in the holistic approach. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. And next up today, we have Rick Miller with the Atlantic Council, the Resilience Hub Network Strategy and Florida Initiative Programs, and he's gonna share with us some of the work that he is doing. Hey, great. Thanks, Kyla. And I know it's been a long afternoon for everybody. So, you know, stretch, jumping jacks, push-ups, whatever you need to do to stay, stay awake. Um, I thank Carolyn for that great uh, lead off to this session and her comments, which are very germane. And, and what I'm going to be talking about is very specifically aimed at Miami-Dade County, which is great, I think, and, and um, you know, lines up with her comments earlier. And some of our other speakers that have highlighted um, things regarding sustainability of programming and, and you know, the resilience and endurance of the, of the resilience programs themselves. And we'll touch on all that a little bit here. So next slide, please. Okay, um, who we are. So about three years ago, uh, some of you may be aware that the uh, Rockefeller Foundation had their 100 Resilient Cities Initiative globally. And as that program was looking to pivot and, and move into a new direction, um, it was able to form a great partnership with Adrian Arsht, who's a philanthropist uh, based in both Miami and Washington. And Adrian, combined with Rockefeller, um, got together and founded the Adrian Arsht Rockefeller Foundation uh, Resilience Center. Uh, it's one of the principal centers within the Atlantic Council, which is a, a Washington, D.C.-based think tank um, that's been around since the early 60s. And the Resilience Center, heavy focus around climate change, um, mitigation strategies, and, and uh, developing resilient solutions for um, uh, community security, individual security, and how we deal with those, with those challenges. And in fact, I'm, I'm bouncing back and forth with another uh, strategic planning conference we're doing at the center this week, and we're focused around initiatives on uh, extreme heat on uh, gaming, in fact, to reach more people and more education and mindset, uh, mind changing strategies around these ideas. Um, obviously, community and individual resilience, and then also looking in areas related to uh, finance and risk management, innovative finance and ways to help address some of these, um, these solutions. So as part of that, and, and, and next slide, please. As, as part of that, um, a few years ago, the, the center created um, uh, the a kind of a first of its kind resilience pod. And the pod was, was initially created to um, help advance the education and knowledge of, of climate change and climate related issues in Miami-Dade County. Um, it, it's a, a old 40 foot shipping container that was completely revitalized and repurposed. Um, right about the time the pod was coming online was when the pandemic began and all these issues around food insecurity and community vulnerabilities really came to the forefront driven by the pandemic and what happened. And so the, the pod really pivoted towards um, helping make that approach. And we've been very successful in reaching uh, more than half the districts in Miami-Dade County with it over the last year and a half. Um, over a couple hundred thousand people uh, have had engagements at the pod. And, and we've also enhanced its own resilience and sustainability. Um, it's now completely solar powered. It has its own solar generation and, and power storage system. 
Um, it, it's got the ability uh, to be a charging station and a, and a mobile Wi-Fi location. So when people are there, they can also plug in and connect to it and provide uh, you know, a prototype for mobile and resilient power and communication solutions. It is part of that um, pod effort, we were approached by the Rebuild Florida uh, group um, who had uh, disaster relief funds from HUD about, you know, hey, could you take that pod and integrate it potentially with the idea of resilience hubs and, and potentially, um, you know, take that in a new direction and, and expand out that concept of resilience hubs. And so that was uh, born about, you know, again, about two years ago, around the time the, the pandemic started. And we've worked and we're, we are now in the early stages. We, we received the grant award last year. We're in the early stages of working with uh, contracting organizations um, to kick off this initiative to really um, build a network uh, strategy of interconnected resilience hubs and pods across Miami-Dade County. Now, the diagram you see there on the right, um, that's not, um, you know, it, that's not to say that's what the network is gonna look like, that's just a notional diagram. But the idea is that resilience hubs are static locations. They're located in, in more vulnerable or more depressed areas of the community where um, services and things sometimes are harder to reach. The idea is to have a location that becomes a trusted partner for the community during blue sky days when there's not a disaster or an issue going on. Um, but it, through that trust and relationship, when we have to shift into the, the cycle of disaster preparation, response and recovery, it's a known lo location that people can go to to get the assistance and the services that they need. It's also a way to expand the network for the emergency operations centers across the county and the municipalities in, in Miami-Dade County and, and network those together in a more robust way. The idea with pods is that the pods can come in now as essentially mobile capabilities and mobile capacity. And they can either, for example, as you see the little green pod up in the upper right, they could go to a location where there's no coverage and, and connect directly into the network and provide you know, immediate response and capabilities where it's needed. Or in the other two examples, they could essentially go in and augment a hub location with additional capabilities or additional capacities that might be needed depending on the nature of the emergency or the disaster uh, response that's going on. Uh, next slide. So as we're working through this process, it's really and kind of going back to what Carolyn said about mapping vulnerabilities. Um, you know, one of the, the, the key steps as we're getting started here is very detailed vulnerability assessment mapping and, and putting that together in, in I would call it a, almost a layer cake model in, uh, where you can see all the different um, metrics involved with community vulnerability and you can layer those together and, and truly determine not only where your most vulnerable areas are but also specifically what are the needs and the gaps to address those vulnerabilities and the idea there is that you know a very detailed vulnerability mapping will help us determine as we go down to figure out where these should be you know, if you look at um, item number three, you know, the network of interconnected sites and creating a prioritized master plan for at least the first uh, three or few hubs, where those should go. We also recognize back to the, the second bullet there, there is no one perfect solution. So a resilience hub in one part of the county in one community um, might need, you know, capabilities A, B and C if you go to a different site, a different community, they might really have a shortfall and need help with items X, Y, and Z. And so the goal here is to not develop a cookie cutter one size fits all, but define a prototypical menu of what resilience hubs could have in them. And as we map that against the vulnerabilities and where the network should place them, that will help decide what capabilities get placed into what particular hubs and also help us determine down to number five, what capabilities from a mobility standpoint would be beneficial to have into mobile pods that can move around and augment or plug into the network when the needs arise. And then ultimately, as we finish out this planning activity, um, our goal is to put together a guidebook and a, a strategy for how to go about this in a, in a county or regional approach and I know it says there, 
transferable across Florida. Obviously, we're contracted with Rebuild Florida, so it has a Florida focus. But the reality is this could be picked up and carried to Georgia, South Carolina, the islands. It doesn't matter. It's it's a concept that we feel when it's done will be very uh, scalable and transferable uh, to virtually any location. Next slide, please. So where we want to go with this and, and, and the goal of this project, um, like I said, we're, we're in the process of kicking off now. It'll play out over a roughly 18 month period. And at the end of that 18 months, um, you know, we're looking to not only be able to help our um, elected officials, our, our fellow uh, uh, nonprofit organizations and others have a greater understanding of the risks and vulnerabilities facing the populations in Miami-Dade County, but also exactly how and where to invest the resources, not just in our, our hubs and pods, which are our, uh, you know, this project's investment into those areas, but it should also inform the community for how other resources can flow in into those because part of those hub locations is, I said, blue sky days, right? You know, you may be doing disaster relief for a fraction of the year. What is the location doing the other 360 some days of the year when there's not a disaster? And so we wanna make sure that there's programming and content that will draw the community in um, that it will help educate and inform them, help close vulnerabilities, reduce vulnerabilities and close gaps, um, help them grow and develop. And again, all of that builds trust so that when you get into the disaster cycle of activities, it's a known trusted location to go to. And so we believe in, in you know, doing that in a sustainable way in, on, on the good weather days, you know, it will have us well positioned to support that disaster preparedness response and recovery. And I think that's the end of my slides. I know we were getting long, so I promised to go quick and short. Um, and Kyla, I'll turn it back over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rick, for sharing a real solution that's you know viable for communities. I'm excited to see uh, where this project goes and the you know the ability to move this into our most vulnerable and communities that need it the most. Um, I think it's a real solution uh, that's sustainable. So I'm excited to see how that works. Thank you. Fantastic. Next, we have Dominica Zhu with the Opportunity Project at the Census Open Innovation Lab. And she is gonna share with us some uh, information on the Opportunity Project. Um, but in addition to that, she is also going to share some information on the indigenous community, uh, which is something very personal to her and I'm excited to hear about. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kyla. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you guys for having me today. Um, my name is Dominique Zhu. I'm the head of human-centered innovation at the Census Open Innovation Labs at the US Census Bureau. Um, as Kyla mentioned, I will cover two separate topics today. First, I'll walk you all through an amazing methodology and program that we have here called the Opportunity, Opportunity Project, or TOP for short, at the US Census Bureau, and how this methodology can be utilized to create solutions that address pressing public needs, including addressing climate crisis, and some highlights from a sprint that we did with NOAA this past year that produced several incredible digital tools for the public to, that seek to tackle the climate crisis. And then I'll just take off my government hat and speak more from a personal perspective on the importance of prioritizing indigenous voices and resources that can be utilized for a more equitable lens. So next slide, please. Um, so in 2015, uh, top, the top team identified that the federal data and the federal data community and community work severely disconnected. Next slide. So top really seek to bring this ecosystem together. Um, and then on the next slide, some of the values of our program include building with rather than for the power of open data to really provide critical solutions and the importance of bringing diverse expertise to the table when rapidly prototyping digital solutions. Um, on the next slide, we, in terms of our mission statement, we bring together technologists, community, and government to rapidly prototype digital products that are, that are powered by federal open data, since we're the U.S. Census Bureau, that solve key national challenges for people and communities nationwide. So you're probably wondering how this all works. So on the next slide, um, if you don't mind going two slides, actually. Um, so we first have our federal agencies identify the national challenge that's in need of a data-driven solution. Um, in the past, these challenges have included environmental challenges, economic development, um, civic education, et cetera. 
Um, next, the tech teams from um, private industry and academia um, sign up to tackle these challenges in a 12 to 14 week sprint cycle. You can skip over two slides. Thank you. Um, next, we assemble a coalition of experts to support these tech teams throughout the progress through a very human-centered approach. So this includes federal agency policy experts who wrote the problem statement, federal data stewards who answer questions about what open data sets are available, um, and then user advocates who represent our community and potential end users of the product. And these also shape the, help shape the, the product that will be developed. In our next slide, um, over the course of 12 to 14 weeks, we have milestone calls um, in which all the sprint collaborators join. Every two weeks, we have a different milestone that focuses on different topics, from user research to data exploration to uh, demos from our tech teams on um, different iterations of the products as they develop. And every step of the way, the cohort is there to give feedback. On our next slide, here are just uh, a few of the teams that have participated in the past. So we've had participation from um, big tech to startups to universities. And on the next slide, uh, to date, over the last six years, we've had over 135 products created um, and catalyzed through our process. And these products had ranged from apps to websites to maps and digital visual visualization. So we've seen a huge variety of technologies come out of our sprint. So on the next slide, um, you're probably wondering how you can get involved. So um, this is a methodology that can be utilized by any community, so it certainly doesn't have to be through our program, but if you are not able to join a sprint, you can consider using our product development toolkit. So on the next slide, it's just a, a snapshot of what that toolkit looks like, and I'll be sure to drop the link um, to that toolkit at the end of my presentation. So this is something that can be utilized by community members to really take this methodology in your own hands, utilize all the federal open data that's available to build solutions for your community. Um, next slide. So last year, uh, we partnered with NOAA to run a sprint around the problem statement tackling the climate crisis through climate smart communities. I wanted to share some of the products that came out of that sprint, hopefully as a tool for all of you to be able to take advantage of. So on the next slide, this challenge statement, I guess what, what NOAA had written um, for our participants was a challenge to create tools that enabled local decision makers um, to enable local decision making about climate resilience and federal capacity to support on local level priorities and to really improve climate resilience planning uh, for communities nationwide. So on the next slide, here's just some, um, some logos of some community members that participated. Shout out to Gary Harris from Center for Sustainable Communities who invited me to this conference, but also was one of our community advocates that really helped shape the products that came out of our sprint. So we worked with a, you know, a range of folks from startups to um, all the folks that you see here um, and, and really helped folks either create a product from scratch or also or refine a product that they are already doing to really incorporate um, other perspectives that weren't currently at the table. So um, these products are all available on our top website and you can look for them to look for them in more depth. But the first product is a product from uh, the team Forerunner. It um, entitled Forerunner for floodplain management dashboard. So this tool enables local government floodplain managers to effectively communicate flood risks and track changes in their community. So definitely check out their tool. On the next slide, um, another tool that came through our sprint was uh, created called the Community Resilience Data Guide by the Team My Sidewalk. This provides local leaders and first responders with critical data and actionable resources on methods to reduce risks associated with increasing temperatures and extreme heat. Um, on the next slide, we have another tool um, created from Deloitte team. It's called the Climunity Planning Tool, and this tool helps um, community planners combine and visualize external um, and local data sets for use in legislative planning, grant applications, and, and other climate response efforts. And lastly, another tool that came out of our sprint is um, City Builder by City Ventures, and this tool provides investors, developers, and municipalities, and other community members to make data-driven insights um, and make meaningful place-based investments. So um, I will drop all the links to, to everything that I just discussed again at the end of the presentation. If you have any questions about TOP or anything that was just discussed in this part of the presentation, please visit our website listed here, opportunity.census.gov, and also feel free to reach out. Email um, census.opportunityproject at census.gov. So hopefully uh, that was all digestible. I know that went by fast. Um, I'm next gonna transition to talk about work I do outside of my role at the US Census Bureau, 
So I'll denote that all things that I'm now discussing are, are entirely views of my own and not the view of the US government. Um, as Kyla mentioned, this is a topic that's very near and dear to me. Um, my mother is an indigenous healer from China, so it's been my passion to advocate for indigenous voices to be at the decision-making table. So I'd like to share some resources on how to prioritize indigenous solutions and when it comes to tackling the climate crisis. So on the next slide, um, Firstly, it's important to note that indigenous people encompass approximately 22% of the world's land surface, and they're estimated to hold 80% uh, of the planet's biodiversity. So as you can see, a very small number of people are responsible for protecting a very great percentage of their planet, of the planet from millennia. And so the protection of these populations and their land is truly crucial. On the next slide, um, just another statistic, uh, indigenous people are as mentioned, part of the vulnerable communities are at the front line of impact for climate crisis. Um, some numbers to keep in mind, over 27 million indigenous people in nearly 2000 communities across 87 countries actually live in these coastal communities that are pretty much under threat when it comes to changes of our planet. Um, on the next slide, um, you know, indigenous solutions are key, but it, you know, it's really not enough to just include indigenous perspectives, but really understand the solutions that these communities have followed for themselves. So in consult with my own community members and other indigenous colleagues, here are some things, food for thought to consider. Prioritizing indigenous leaders at the decision-making table, um, avoiding extractive approaches and prior, prioritizing careful knowledge sharing. So of course, it's important to note that uh, the exploitation, extraction, and inequity that have uh, these communities have faced uh, historically and presently. So knowledge transfer should always occur from a very careful and, and careful place, um, a loving place in a way that there's a lot of reciprocity rather than always just asking for um, you know, information and, and it coming off as extractive, exploitative. Um, really prioritizing indigenous-led research. Uh, it's important to fund and understand the data that comes from indig indigenous-led research to avoid unintentional harm with present ac activities and programs. To really prioritize traditional ecological knowledge and the protection of it when it comes to climate change initiatives. Um, prioritizing the protection of indigenous land and really thinking about the effects of everything that we're doing when it comes to um, change base, change displacement on natives. Um, and of course, preservation of indigenous language. This is often a casualty when it comes to cri climate crisis as a result of the loss of cultural identity when we are losing populations of people. Um, so I'm just gonna share some other existing initiatives and efforts and orgs that from an indigenous land lens, some of these are not may not be specific to the Southeast US region, but can still be very helpful as a reference point. So the first is uh, the Indigenous Climate Action Toolkit from the Indigenous Climate Action Group. This is a group um, out of Canada, but they still have provided crucial research and values and knowledge when it comes to solutions on climate change. The toolkit has really sought to bring together a network of indigenous climate change experts um, to really empower those communities. On the next slide, um, this group also has great publications around what it means to decolonize climate policy that you guys um, would definitely highly recommend to check out. On the next slide, is an example of changes that were made as a result of investment towards indigenous communities. So this is this is taken off of um, some work from Cultural Survival. They're a nonprofit that supports indigenous groups across the globe. Um, on the next slide, um, there's a group called South Central Climate Adaptation Science Center. They have awesome resources when it comes to climate adaptation and vulnerability assessment specific to tribal communities. And then on the next slide, they also provide tribal adaptation planning resources. So this is also something to um, take into consideration. Um, on the next slide is uh, the climate change resources. They also have really great uh, resources when it comes to how climate change affects US-based tribes. So definitely something to uh, look into. Um, on the next slide um, is another uh, resource. It's a toolkit that's created from indigenous leaders on guidelines for considering traditional knowledge when it comes to climate change initiatives. It goes through a step-by-step -step process on ways that that can be thoughtfully integrated into existing programs. Um, and then on the next slide, this is an organization that I actually founded called the Global Wisdom Collective, and we work on protecting traditional ecological knowledge alongside other indigenous communities. Um, and then on the next slide is just an article on the importance of decolonizing climate adaptation research. And a quote from this article is that indigenous-led research can help determine whether the inclusion of human rights protections 
averts or minimizes severe consequences that are associated with government mandated relocation. So for example, in a letter to the US National Science Foundation expressing concerns with a navigating new Arctic program for Alaskan native organizations, we're able to explain the danger and damage to their communities when outside academics define food security, resilience, and adaptation. So this really demonstrates the often blind spots that can occur and unintended harm when we don't really consider indigenous voices at the table in our research. Um, the next slide is just an article highlighting the effects of climate change and, and what that means threatening sacred land and how that really is a population loss, identity loss. And um, the last slide is just a list of organizations to look into if you're looking to support um, existing work. Um, you know, I'll just leave this as it's truly important to prioritize indigenous people at the decision making table, but to also compensate them properly for their knowledge and wisdom um, and to really consider um, indigenous solutions into your program efforts. And, you know, there's been amazing speakers now. So it, this is not an exhaustive list, um, but just a starting point. So really, really appreciate the time and attention. Um, you guys can email me um, on dominikazoo at gmail.com. If you guys want to get in contact about the Opportunity Project, you guys can also contact me there. But I'll drop all the resources into the chat now. But thank you, guys. Oh, there we go. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Domenica. What a fantastic inclusion in the Indigenous communities. You know, I've been listening to a lot of webinars lately talking about how really our indigenous communities have been doing mitigation and adaptation for so long that they're such a valuable resource. Um, so I really appreciate you highlighting, um, again, the importance and then of course the Opportunity Project, being able to use that data um, and all that open data that exists into usable solutions and in ways that you know really will help foster change in communities. Awesome, thank you. Well, we appreciate everyone joining us today. I know we ran through a whole host of resources and tools and strategies for you, um, but we hope that you were able to at least gain some knowledge and transfer that to your communities or through your networks, um, give you some ideas of where to start taking your endeavors. Um, at this time, I will turn it back over to Lindy to close us out for the day.